and your advocacy work, who are we all thinking about? Who is this session for? Well, who are we trying to serve? The disenfranchised, excellent. Incarcerated, excellent, excellent. Children, I'm sorry? The homeless, mental health. Thank you all. I normally try to write notes, but we're gonna keep going. And women, yeah. Nobody's paying attention to women's voices. But... I'm sorry? Senior citizens, absolutely, absolutely. Excellent. Well, some of these ways in which we can think about the unheard as it goes through again, is that, I'm gonna hit stop. These are people that no one really pays attention to. Oftentimes the unheard feel powerless. Doesn't mean that they are powerless, but they feel powerless. The unheard are people who often have limited resources to make the change in their lives. When we think about mental health or even the seniors, sometimes they're on fixed income. They can't make the change that they need to make. And sometimes they feel invisible. And I put those in quotation marks because sometimes even though people feel that way, it doesn't mean that they are. And as advocates, sometimes the work that we have to do is to help them understand that they're visible and that they matter and that they count. And the work that we're doing, the things that they can do to make a change in their own lives. All right, so what does it mean to be a public voice? When we talk about you're gonna be a public voice for the unheard, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? A person that will speak up for those that are less fortunate? Yes. What else did you say? You're just getting a whole presentation. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Since I can stop it. Okay, let's see. No. I've never seen this happen before. It just does it on your own time. All right, well, I think we've stopped it. Okay, to be a public voice, let's see if we can move forward, is to say that I see you and that I hear you. When you all are people in public, to, you're the ones that are given the voice to these people. You are the people that have power. You are the people that have influence. You are the people that have authority, even though you don't think you have authority. But most importantly, perhaps you are the people who have an audience. You have people that you can reach to kind of speak to people on behalf of others. And that's something a lot of times we don't think about. Who is your target? We're gonna talk about that a little bit more. Who is your target? Who are the people that you can advocate for and advocate with, okay? So, and this is important for communities of faith. And I have to be honest, when I was asked to speak, When I was asked to speak, I was a little surprised because part of what you do as communities of faith is that you all are serving and you're advocates anyway. But the role of communities of faith, I think even more so in this day and age, is that you are to say to the unheard that you matter, that your voice matters, that your situation mm -hmm. matters. And as someone who's called to faith, here we are again, Lord have mercy. And I think it's really important especially with community, community space, to be advocates because you are people who've heard the call in whatever way the Lord speaks to you, in a, whatever way that you decide that you're going to serve. And you say to yourself, this is what I'm going to do with my life. Even if it's not your entire life's work, you've made a decision that you're going to serve. Okay. Now, this next slide is really important to me. Um, my background is in African-American studies. So I have my master's and my doctorate in African-American studies. And the interesting thing about African-American studies is that the deeper that you go into it, a lot of people think, oh, it's about white folks. We gotta figure out what white folks did to us. No, the deeper you go into African-American studies, it's really about the self. It's really about who we are. It's really about our culture. It's really about how we're going to embrace the world and show up in the world. But part of that self-knowledge is really understanding who you are and what you can do. And I know we all like, oh, I can do it all. I can do everything. And so when we think about self-knowledge, especially when it comes to your advocacy work, you really have to think about what you can and cannot do. So you have to think about your energy levels. Are you someone who wants to get up in the morning and do things? Are you gonna do, be able to do stuff after work, after you know, nine to five, you gotta take care of the kids and then they want you to go to some meeting and do some Zoom meeting, then you gotta go feed the homeless and 
do you have the energy for that? You gotta be honest about that. Because I think sometimes in our advocacy work, we tend to do too much. And we're not really honest with who we are about what I can really do in terms of managing my energy levels, okay? What's your passion? What is it that you're really interested in? Well, you know, the church says we wanna, we wanna do feed the homeless. You're like, ah, that's not really my thing. But I feel like I have to do it with the Doris Bland Society. They don't feed the homeless. That's not what I wanna do. And so sometimes if you're not really into it, your energy is not there, your passion, and you're not really being an advocate the best way you can. So you got to be honest with who you are and what you want to do. And even though the church may say it or your friends may want to do this, you have to be honest and say, that's not what my interest is, okay? Um, your commitment. If you're going to sign up for the blood drive, or you're going to show up on that Saturday at six o'clock in the morning, you know, we all know, we've all been a part of committees and organizations where there's only the three or four or five people that do the same thing all the time. When you had a committee meeting, everybody signed up. You had 20 people on the committee meeting. And when you came down to the Saturday morning at six o'clock in the morning to do the work, you only had five people show up. So as advocates, we really have this. So I'm saying you have to be honest with who you are. Don't do things because everybody else is doing it. Are you going to get up at six o'clock in the morning? I'm not. I'm, honest, I'm, I'm not the morning person. My sister will get up and, and do that. But I have to be drag kicking and screaming to go do something at six o'clock in the morning. But you got to be honest, okay? Um, the power of limits. We often think of limits as something that's restrictive, but limits are very powerful because limits can contain something. With limits, we say, this is the space and this is a sphere from which I can operate. And sometimes when we limit ourselves, we're much more powerful and much more impactful when we limit ourselves. And of course, the importance of rest. Get your rest, get your rest, get your rest. We work really, really hard. We've got many things on our plates. Y'all have full-time jobs, people have families, you have your other commitments. And it's important if you're gonna be advocates that you get the rest. And of course, as I said earlier, be clear about what you can and cannot do. If you know you don't know social media, don't volunteer to do a social media campaign. I'm gonna get my daughter, my daughter's gonna miss my mom. My daughter's gonna be in town and she'll help me with the email. <laughs> and so, but you still have to be honest and say, maybe I shouldn't do the social media. I should let someone else do it, okay? All right, that one stopped on us. All right, now. I'm gonna try to go back, I'm gonna go back. Okay, can I, I'm gonna stay right here and then just hit the pause. Okay, thank you. Okay, so sometimes there's, People don't understand the difference between advocacy and service. Because if people of faith and in church, we're like, oh, but I, I'm, we already serve. So how is that different from advocacy? And I wanted to really kind of talk about that a little bit because, and if I had my slow down microphone, I'd be going around asking all y'all. I'm still gonna get y'all, don't worry. I got some questions for you. So advocacy is a little different than service in the sense that it's a little bit more strategic. We're, we're focusing on something, a, a clear goal that we can reach. Advocacy creates change. And I, I'm gonna give you all some examples. Actually, I'm gonna ask you some examples before I move on to my next slide. Advocacy is often political. And I know sometimes as church members, we may not wanna get political, but sometimes if we're gonna really have the impact in our communities that we need, we're gonna to have to get political. And there's so many different ways in which we can be political. With advocacy, we're wanting to address some of the root causes of the inequality and injustice that we have in our society. How can we, you know, we can feed the homeless, but what can we do to kind of get rid of homelessness or the hungry? What can we do, right, you know, right now we have such a food insecurity in our country. So we can feed the children, we can do, give money to the food bank, but why do we have food insecurity in our country? We're the richest country in the world. So advocacy work is trying to address that change. And maybe we need to do a little bit more in terms of getting fresh fruits and vegetables to our communities. Maybe we need to have some more community gardens. Maybe we need to talk to the black farmers, these little, you know, these little bodegas that are just selling, you know, noodles and noodles. How can we get fresh fruits and vegetables into those? So that's why advocacy work is different. We're trying to really address that root cause. And of course, we want to influence public policy. And sometimes that maybe we have to engage with our political leaders in ways in which we may not want to or that we're not comfortable with. But that's what advocacy work requires. And if y'all want me to stop and y'all can take notes, please let me know. And I'll be happy to share this with the, with the organization when we're done. Okay. And then service. 
service is a little different because we're addressing a particular need. People are homeless or they're hungry, we're gonna feed them. Oh Lordy, here we go, let me go back, okay. Service sometimes addresses the individual need or family. So Christmas time, we're all giving toys to the children and to their family. So we're serving that particular need that's right there in our faces. Service, as you all know, is a form of ministry. How am I serving the community? How am I serving the world at large? What is my ministry? My girlfriend says, my ministry is this. And sometimes we don't think of our work as ministry, but it's a type of ministry. It's not just your ministers and your senior pastors up here that are doing ministerial work. It provides some sort of help and assistance when needed. And a lot of times it's just volunteers and we're gonna show up and we're gonna give food to the food bank. So those are some of the ways in which they're a little bit different. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay. Oh. Well, what's the key ingredient for advocacy work? And <laughs> this passion. You got to have passion. You've got to really want to do it. You've got to really be concerned. You've got to really care to do this work. Again, we all have our own passions. Some of y'all may want to clean up the environment. Some of you may want to help the black farmers. Some of you may want to help children. We got to increase those math and reading scores. That means we got to be in those schools every day. We've got to be in that classroom and help those teachers. So you got to have that passion and the desire because that's what's going to carry you through. A lot of times people underestimate that. When I was working on my dissertation, my friend's husband had finished his and he, he you know, he did his like in a year and a half. I'm still slugging away years. He's like, Aaron, just write on anything. You just, just, just do, just do a topic on it. I'm like, are you kidding? How can you do all this work that's required? Research and the writing without having a passion for it without caring. I could not wrap my mind about someone committing so much of your life to such something so important without the passion, without the care. So in your advocacy work, really follow your passion and follow your heart as you're doing it. Let's see what we got next. All right, so how do we approach advocacy? Okay, and there's two ways to do it. I know people may be like, hmm, that's unusual. You can approach it through talking about the issue, or you can approach it by talking about dealing with people and what makes them different. If you're working with people, you're having a direct impact on people. You're working with the kids, you're feeding the homeless. You're, you're right there with the people in the community. But if you're talking about the issue, that's more of an indirect impact. So when we think about climate change and the environment, it's gonna imp impact people eventually, but it's gonna be more of an indirect result, but it's still gonna create a change that ultimately society will feel. Does that make sense? So sometimes you all, you know, if you think about, if you wanna deal with people directly, then think of issues that deal with directly with people versus issues. Any questions on that? Okay. Now, hopefully this will stop and we can talk about this a little bit more. This is really key in advocacy work. What system, in what system are you operating? How are you doing your advocacy work? Because that's gonna determine your strategies, that's gonna determine your impact, that's gonna determine your approach. So if you're with a community-based organization or a nonprofit, your approach to doing advocacy work is gonna be very different. Sometimes you're just like, we just gotta keep it moving. We may not have all the resources that other organizations do but we're gonna have direct impact with the people. But a lot of times when we think about advocacy work and doing work in our community, we tend to think that community-based organizations and nonprofits are really the only way to do it. And so we miss other opportunities to do advocacy work and be engaged in making a change. And I know back when I was you know, coming out, when I graduated from college, people were like, well, if you work for corporate America, you know what a sellout. But sometimes we need to be in those corporate spaces so that we can really impact that change within the corporation and also impact what they do with their money. You know, you might get that corporate job and you might be the director of, of their resources or their foundation and their giving. And they might not even be aware of, of issues. But getting into those corporate spaces is really, really, really an important part in terms of helping direct where those corporations go, okay? A large nonprofit, 
the Red Cross, the American Heart Association. You know, my sister is a heart bypass survivor, heart trip bypass, yeah, quadruple bypass. And she's been very involved with the American Heart Association. And this happened about five or six years ago. And really since then, they're like, we really have to reach out into the communities of color and women with heart issues and stroke because we really haven't made those inroads in those communities. But we all know that heart disease is no one killer of women in this country. And so if they're gonna have impact, they're gonna have to reach out into communities of color. So now they have had this whole approach of hiring more people to really have impact, to really advocate for heart disease in our communities of color. So sometimes we need to be in those spaces. We have to look to those larger organizations to advocate. And if we, do, if we see that they're not doing it, we need to re, really need to help kind of find a way to redirect that. When we see that companies and, and people that are supposed to be responsive to our needs are not. Like what's the American Cancer Society doing with cancer in the black community? What are they doing with prostate cancer? Do they have any kind of outreach for prostate cancer in black men? We know that they do a lot for, for breast cancer, but what are they doing for breast cancer for black women? So we need these large entities to advocate on our behalf. And sometimes we, we need to be in those spaces to do that as well. And finally, we have the government and political offices. Sometimes we not wanna to run to office. Sometimes we may, but we may be able to engage them in a different way. And I will have to say a little word about lobbying because lobbying, is like the next step after advocacy work. But lobbying is much more difficult. It's much more, uh, there's a whole legal framework involved with lobbying. You have to have, not that it's not the 5013C, it's the 501C4, I think, if you're gonna be a political entity. And if you're going to do that, there's a whole set of parameters that's gonna be required, but you can still do advocacy work with your political, with your political um, politicians. You can say, we want you to support initiatives that do this. But if you say, we want you to support House Bill number 536 that's going to do X, Y, and Z, that's lobbying. So as you do your advocacy work, be clear on the differences so that you don't get in trouble where people are going to accuse you of lobbying when you're not actually doing lobbying work. Are there any questions? All right, let's move on. I was able to stop that one. All right. Potential minefields. Stop for me. Okay. We have to know the law. And it's very interesting because I just moved from Virginia, North Carolina, and the laws from state to state are different. We have to be clear on what the laws are in our states, in our counties, in our communities. In terms of in Virginia, if you register, help people register to vote, you can stand outside and help them. Give water, you can do that. But other states, you can't do that. So we have to really be clear so that we don't get in trouble. And so you have to have somebody on your team that's really clear and understanding what the law is. The other one, and this is something folks really don't really talk about in advocacy work, is that you gotta know your enemies. We, we, we're in a whole different day and, game, day and age. Who are you up against? I think about where I, some of the stuff that I did you know, 10, 20 years ago, you know, I think the world, I guess maybe we think of the 70s, 80s and 90s, we kind of were all moving forward. We kind of knew the system and the structure and we kind of were working through that because we all understood the rules of the game. But now, rules of the games are changing. The rule rug is being pulled out from under us and we have to be clear on who the enemy is and what their agenda is because we were, we're sitting here trying to get voting rights. Yeah, we got, we got voter registration, but we might have to think about voting registration completely different now. We might have to think about, well, they're kind of gerrymandering these districts. And then they're trying to move so that the black vote is here. Well, then maybe what we need to do, maybe some of us need to start moving over to some of these other areas so that we can influence the population. I mean, these are different things. We have to kind of think about what it is that they're doing. Sadly, sadly, we have to react to what our enemy is doing. But if we don't adjust, we're gonna be operating under a template that's for a different time and a different age. And part of where we are right now as a community is that we have to adjust our advocacy work and our strategies in terms of understanding where our enemy, who our enemy is and what we're up against. And the enemy might not be people. It could just be an entity, an organization. But we have to kind of be clear on, on what it is that we're up against, what it is that we're fighting. 
we can't just be like, oh, let's just keep, we're going to feed the kids at Christmas time each year after year after year. That's not really creating change. And that's not really addressing the issue. All right. Any questions on that? Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What we have to do, and part of it is our state constitution, the state constitution gives the legislature the right to cha change districts whenever there's a census. And if there are majority, and, and the Democrats do it too, Democrats, Republicans, and both parties do it. But what has to happen is that you can't do it in such the way that you dilute the power. And that's when you have those lawsuits. North Carolina had the last few, was it 2016, 2018, where they said they was like, was it with a knife, with precision, that they said, as opposed to Guilford County having maybe two or three districts, they tied Guilford County to maybe the rural parts of Orange County, so that the more people in Orange County have more of a, of a say than people in Guilford County. And so what happens in advocacy work is that you might do, there might be a lawsuit or that you might sign an amicus brief or that you support the lawyers or the NAACP or some of the other organizations that are challenging these things legally. And that if there's protest and marches about that, if there's media, if there's an education campaign to, to, to get the people, you know, the, the citizens to understand what that issue is, that's advocacy work. But in situations like that, the only redress are the courts because of the way our legislature is written. But what can happen is you say, we don't want this to happen in the future. So, so what we might need to do, we might get more young people to run for political office. We gotta start playing the long game, right? Because the enemy has been playing the long game for 20, 30 years. You know, they see the population trends and we're just like, oh, da, 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 we're just living our lives. And so what we might need to do is say, you young 18, 19, 25 year olds, these young kids who are, y'all need to start running for office. You all need to start running for school board and county commissioner and city council so that by the time we can get you to the state legislature, we have enough of a critical mass in the state legislature. So by the time the next census rolls around, the time we do the next gerrymandering, we have people there who are gonna support our interests. And so sort of sometimes with advocacy, we've got to do more long, that's what I'm saying, more long-term strategic thinking. Where are our numbers gonna be? What's the, what are the population trends? You know, we might not be able to do it right now because we have got a 10 year window but this is not gonna happen again, right? So that's how we have to think about it. I think someone had a question then I'll do you next. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, let me give you the microphone. It's a little feedback. Okay. I don't know, maybe not. You want him closer? Okay, there we go. <laughs> well, what I wanted to say was, <laughs> you, know, when you, you listen to gerrymandering, a lot of people don't know what it targets. So would you say that gerrymandering targets control of state legislature more than federal? What benefit, who benefits best? Okay. And, and what, where should we target our vote? Should we target to control the state legislature? or federal, because a lot of people think that the president elect, he's gonna do something, but the control that's in the state and the, the person that goes to the Congress. So what does gerrymandering target in terms of control? Could you that? That's a good question, very good. Did everybody hear his question? His question was, when we talk about gerrymandering, what is the issue of control? Is it at the federal level in terms of a representation that goes to Congress or is it at the state level with our state legislation? And I would answer that it's both. I would definitely answer that it's both because our state legislature creates our state constitution, the laws and sets the framework for how we vote for Congress and how we vote for Senate. So like for example, North Carolina a and used to have one precinct for voting because of popular they have split North Carolina ANT in half. So we have diluted the vote of those students and they used to have their own like voting precinct. That's another thing too. You wanna to have a voting precinct in your area. 
So once you dilute the vote for North Carolina a and that can determine who's gonna go to the state legislature. That's gonna determine, not, so the state legislature is, is sometimes all of those people are on the same ballot. You know, we have some of our, our politicians that are, that, you know, that are on the state legislature here. And that's, that's where we kind of have to pay attention to the, these state and local races as well. And then gerrymandering is also going to impact who the students in North Carolina a and vote for. So students on the dorm, one dorm is going to vote for Congressman A, and the students in another dorm are going to vote for Congressman B. And maybe Congressman A is not going to really support the issues of the population of Congressman B. And so what gerrymandering does is that it takes away your representation in votes. So for example, in Texas, and I can't think of the town, there's a, a urban, it's kind of outside of San Antonio, very, it's a, it's a small college there, very diverse. You know, you wouldn't think you know, Muslims, Christian, LGBTQ, the artists, you know, it's just a whole college kind of town. They have gerrymandered that district so that it goes all the way up into the corners and the panhandle of Texas rural areas where there's small towns of like, you know, 500 people. So you have a small urban district tied to this large rural swath of voters who are not necessarily going to represent the interests of the people in that urban district. And so when you have that state, when you have that state legislature draw that map, that's going to impact, obviously, the federal elections, but it's also going to impact the state. And as much as we want to talk about our Congress people, we really have to talk about what's happening on our state and local level, because there's the ones that control the purse spring. We got all this money, we got all that COVID money, right? People are like, where is the COVID money and how is it impacting the black community? Who is being accountable for that? And that's where your state and local legislatures come in. Because if the state is getting $500 million of COVID relief money, oh, we're gonna put this money in the black community, we're gonna do X, Y, and Z, and then we never hear anything else about it. That's why you have to have representation on that state or local level. You've got to have people who are going to keep asking those questions. So as advocates, we have to go out and say, you know, Governor Cooper, Environment EPA, what's happening with this money? What are we doing? So this is, this is what it means in terms of doing that advocacy work to kind of figure out. We've got, to, we've got to hold people accountable and be able to answer some of these questions. So when we think about what's happening with gerrymandering, you know, and with voting, it, it's no joke. I know students are like, oh, voting. We have like a different group every week coming on campus trying to register students to vote. They're like, I don't get it. I'm so bored. I'm so tired of this issue. But it impacts everything that's going to happen in their life from this point forward when they become adults. You know, where y'all going to live? Let's talk about the housing crisis. Why do we have a housing crisis right now? What's happening in our, in our older, senior, established African American homes with gentrification? Where they're paying somebody, I'm gonna give you a hundred thousand dollars. Like, oh, do I got a hundred thousand dollars for my house? And then they come and build a house on it that's worth three hundred thousand dollars. And then you think you've got a nice little nest egg, but that's not any wealth that you can leave your ne next generation. That's not any wealth that you can leave your children, because land and property is the or the assets. So, what are we doing to kind of combat gentrification? What laws? What local ordinances are being passed to allow that to happen? So, with advocacy work, we have to go in and say to the city council. Y'all not gonna pass this bill that's gonna allow ABC Builder to come in. What are the tax incentives that you're gonna give our seniors so that they can stay in their homes? I actually, I'm jumping ahead of myself. But all of us, that's the kind of advocacy work that we have to be doing. We have to kind of think more long-term in terms of how these things are gonna impact our communities. Because it's not, it's not just volunteerism. This is doing some serious hard work that's gonna challenge the system and make it more likely. Exactly, exactly. 
And that's 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 what some of the some what and you have to kind of build allies. That's another thing too. It can't just be the five of y'all. You can't just be the five. And that's one of when you say going to city council, you got we've start we gotta start pushing our, our local leaders to give our seniors in these established neighborhoods these tax incentives that if you've been here for 20, 30 years, you're gonna we're gonna freeze your tax rates. I mean, there's just certain things that 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 has to be done and and actually I have, we kind of did some of this work with the city of Raleigh with the greatest community conversations where people, and we kind of came up with some of these really innovative and creative ideas in terms of trying to address it. But one of the things I would encourage you all to do, even though we may not want to go to city council meeting after city council, and I'm gonna get y'all next, is that um, read your city and your county's 10 year, 20 year plan, the long-term plan. I was working with uh, some grassroots organizers in Cary Cary has one of the oldest black neighborhoods and it's right across from downtown Cary and it's called Cary 2040. And they say, oh, we're gonna get this community because all the black folks are gonna die off anyway and then we're gonna take the property. And I mean, it's, it's, they wrote it clear as day. As soon as the older black folks die off, we're gonna you know, come over here and swoop up and take this property and we're gonna stay at this. Right, so because now that we know that that's part of the plan, then we can, that's why you have to know your enemy. That's now we can figure out a way to kind of fight and address it. What other allies and advocates can we get on our side? And I've got these people back here with a question. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And this all our great advocates back to the church. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the church has become advocated this position as advocates for the church. Too many churches are in the church. We break ties and talk in the church. But you don't advocate when these people bring in like some crazy ties to the church. But nobody, the Lord is silent in the church. Mm -hmm. for, for advocating for right about the thing about gerrymandering, those things that affect us uh, locally. Mm -hmm. I represent something common. I represent the church has been silent. Yeah. And, 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 and the, people, the church is supposed to us to tie and bring an offering. But, but what are we getting in return? Who's speaking for us? All of our, all of the churches are in the room. Mm -hmm. 97 percent of stuff is coming inside, but nothing going outside. We don't have representation for the poor. The church, every church in the community, is doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. These churches got together, these preachers got together to advocate for us. Exactly. Then we would have a point. White people got that. That's our enemy. Mm -hmm. The white evangelical is our enemy. Mm -hmm. But now we are solid in the church. We can let them say anything in the white church about that one church in part say they don't want no Democrats in the church. But, but the black church is scared of the government to say anything about the government. How did that happen? We have no, mm -hmm. The church don't have power that can use that in most everybody in the whole world. The one that owns the heart. And no care about your one. That's why the lady just talking about their community. They probably just them five people. And the church they go to don't represent them. Exactly. They don't know what's going on. They don't know their ministry, how it's going to affect them, how the school represents South and Washington, all of those things. The church is okay. I'm saying they won't do it. And, 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 and this is. When we talk about the decline of the church, and my mother and I, we talk about this all of the time. Our family church in Newport News is right in the heart of the community. It's like, you know, but what are we doing to impact that larger community? And so not only does each individual church need to pay attention to what's happening to their members, like you said, we have to have a collaboration of churches. This civil rights movement would not have happened with all those different preachers who came together and brought all their different churches together. And another thing that had to happen, people had to put their ego aside. You had Martin Luther King, who was 26 years old, he was young. 
they, 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 you know, they, y'all know they forced it on them because they, don't, the, the, the church elders didn't want to upset the, the, the burn have an elite. But Abernathy had to quell his, his ego. C.T. Vivian had to quell his ego. All the rest of them had to say, I'm going to step back and I'm going to be a foot soldier. I'm going to be a partner. We're going to work collaboratively and collectively. And then, you know, with convening such as this, and I'm not really sure how y'all, you know, I know this is with the women's auxiliary, but how we get the larger Black Baptist tradition in, in the state of North Carolina, as well as other denominations. And maybe we have to go back and do that again. We have to go back and do that again where the churches, you know, has to be the arm for our communities. You, any black neighborhood in this country, we got three or four churches and they all should be out there doing something every Saturday and every Sunday after church, doing something in the community. And we need to be, you can't really talk church, you know, politics from the pulpit, but you know, after church is over two o'clock, we go down to the fellowship hall and we can have planning meetings and we can use that space to organize. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. And I also wanted to add one more thing in terms of how we're talking about the churches moving forward. This is how you bring young people back to the church. Young people want to see organizations and entities that are doing something. No, you, you know, these young people are too savvy. They're like, don't give me lip service. You know, I want to talk about what Jesus did. Let's see what we, if Jesus was here right now, he would be out here doing X, Y, and Z. They want to model that. They want to be involved. They want to be engaged. And Christ has kept young people really admire their elders and want to learn from their elders. They want to learn from y'all. They want to, you know, I've had students before, they're like, and I, I teach African-American history and they would say to me, well, why don't our elders tell us these stories? Why haven't they told us these things? Because they want, they need that. They want to hear it. You know, young people love their grandparents. A lot of times maybe because the grandparents are telling them the stories of what it was like. So how do you bring young people back to the church? We've got some programs and some projects for you. Y'all want to be social activists? You can be a social activists here in the church and use the resources of the church to kind of be more engaged in the community. Somebody else had a question. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You got to be in the we the church got to make sure that we prayed about it before we start. Then when we vote, they'll know how to hear Right. That's right. And that's what happened in the, that's what happened in the past. Yeah. They hear people talk but they need to see your action. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And when they see their action, they're like, yeah, I'm going to go to this church because this church is doing some things. Mm hmm and I know young people who are part of the church, and I picked that church because this church is doing X, Y, and Z. They'll tell you. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a challenge. I that all churches I think are facing that. Okay. I have written the way you want to change some of those old traditions is to do that Well. That's something. 
Yes, back here in the back again. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's true. So if he's not keeping political habits, and don't don't think in politics he should not be in the church. If you're not in politics in church now, you're not looking out for the people. Yeah. Because you live in a society where the government we control our government. That's right. You know, we pay our taxes in the government. So it has to be a time. Hope it has to be a place that we see as people about what's going on in the news. You know, some people don't believe Jesus will come back. Some people don't worry about it. Yeah, right. Some people just have passed. If God has seen, it's going to make a difference in our community. There's going to be enough there to make it in the community. But it has to come in that post. You can go back to your church, all your life, and bring back in the church. Get in that post. Some of God will go home and go. Uh-oh. 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 Uh-oh
we have to really understand what we're up against as we're doing our work. Okay. All right, let's see. And then what we have to do is kind of operationalize our terms. Okay. What does change mean to you? What does change mean to your organization? What does change mean to you on a personal level, on a family level? How do y'all operationalize that? Is change, we wanna increase tutor kids so that their test scores go up by five points. That might be a change. And then also, what does it mean to fight? We have to start thinking about advocacy work in terms of fighting. I know as Christians, we all wanna think that we're peaceful, but now we might have to start thinking about advocacy work in terms of war. That we have to really see this as a war. And I, in my African American studies, I used, to, I used to use this all the time. For me, everything is D Day. We gotta have air assault, land assault, sea assault. We can't just act like, you know, the airplane's gonna do it all for us. We have to have a multi prong, multi strategic approach to how we do these things. And I mean, we don't wanna think about it in terms of war, but, you know, the battle is not won. So think about what those terms mean in terms of what does change mean to you in terms of your work and what does it mean to fight? It doesn't necessarily have to, of course, fighting doesn't have to be violent. Fighting can just be political. Fighting could be, I'm gonna, we're gonna do a, a phone bank. We're gonna, or fighting is we're gonna defeat this bill that's right before our, our state legislature. So just think about those terms and, and then and maybe that'll help add a little bit more clarity in terms of what it is and the work that you're doing. And as we think about change, what is the ultimate goal of what it is that you want to change? What is it that you're trying to achieve? So when we think about those different spaces I talked about, that's gonna help determine what it is that you're gonna actually do. So do you wanna do a fundraising campaign? Our goal is to raise $100,000 for this project. Do we want to affect policy change? What are we gonna to do to ensure that our seniors and black communities do not have to face this gentrification anymore? What policies are we going to try to fight to, to, or try to advocate for, or to help lobby for, so that we can ensure that these things, you know, stop happening? Or what are we going to do to raise awareness? Again, we can't have our young people run for political office unless they're aware of what the issues are. So all of the things that you think about what your ultimate goal is, and then you kind of have to do backward planning. I want to get here. And then everything else that you do is backward planning to get to that goal. And so this is just a couple of examples. Okay. So we want our seniors to stay in their homes. So we wanna advocate for a change in the tax law so that we don't feel like we're forced to sell our homes. There has to be a change in public policy where we're gonna allow people that have lived in our homes for 30 plus years or from 1980 on, 1965, if it's three or four generations, they have first, they have right of first refusal or that you know, the developers can't come in, you know, encroach upon these neighborhoods. We're gonna say that the developers can't go here. Y'all can go out to the county where there's extra land, but you can't come into urban areas, something to that effect. Or financial support for our seniors to, to, to repair their homes. A lot of times city council says, well, these houses are, are in decrepit conditions. So let's just knock them down and improve, you know, urban renewal, right? And the way to call it urban renewal, improve our communities. So, what are incentives that we can give our seniors? And, and city of Raleigh has, because we're looking at housing in terms of some of the work that we're gonna do. City of Raleigh has all kinds of housing programs, but there, it, it's so difficult to navigate. People don't know how to work the system. And it's, it, I think, intentionally obtuse so that our people can't figure out how to work yeah. the system. So when we think about our advocacy work, you know, I'm like, oh, let's go and repair homes. We might need to go in there and do some workshops to help our seniors navigate and do these apply for these loans so that they can keep on keeping their homes. So there's all sorts of ways in which people try to, that's why you have to know your enemy and know what they're doing. Y'all, if any of y'all have not been to Raleigh, downtown Raleigh recently, you see all the new condos and high rises and it's, it's, it's just all over. And those were long established black neighborhoods. You know, every, it's happening everywhere. So for another example, we want to increase police accountability. Uh, citizen review boards who can review what's happening in terms of they're, do they, are they, are they gonna be able to have to get pay insurance for when they shoot someone? And 
we are we able to see the disciplinary records? Raleigh used to have a citizens review board. The current mayor got rid of it. Everybody's up in arms about it. We need we need to advocate and bring that back. There's too many shootings in Raleigh late, lately. Since I've been there since in a year, there's been about like three or four police killings since I've since I've been in Raleigh. That's that's that percentage is ridiculous. But we don't have any kind of accountability. Um, increased DEI training, you know, understanding your hidden bias. Black, I do, I do have to say, I'm so scared of black people. Well, why are you scared of black people? Let's unpack that and figure out what that's about. Or are you just going to use that as an excuse? But we've got we to start getting to the root of these things. And then we have to have transparency. So these are just some examples of what that advocacy work will look like. And when we think about the work that we do in terms of reading that, meeting that long-term objective, we've got to have SMART goals. How many of y'all have heard of SMART goals before? I'm going to go back to the SMART goals. Oh, goodness. Ooh, look at that. So the SMART goals are specific measurable, they must be actionable or attainable. They are realistic um, and relevant, and they must be time bound or time based. Um, I'm a little bit on the unrealistic side. I submitted my strategic plan. I said, well, we're gonna do this housing project and we're gonna do it with the kids who are locked up in juvenile detention. And we're gonna do the kids with the students with Shaw and we're gonna do it all by in the spring semester. <laughs> the dean was like, I don't think so. So it was completely unrealistic. Despite my passion, I was all excited. I mean, I felt some type of way when I got my plan back and it was written red and it was like, but it was not realistic. And I had to, okay, I was like, yeah, I, we can't do that with a staff of two. So, no. So make sure your plans are, are your plans are realistic. So for example, I want to clean up beach pollution. All right, that's, not, that's nice. What does that mean? What does that look like? So a specific, I might have to read this on my screen because it's a little too far for my eyes. Okay, so be specific, which beach? I want to remove all the pollution on Carolina Beach. Not all the beaches in North Carolina, but let's just start with Carolina Beach. Measurable, I wanna remove two tons of trash. So when we reach our two tons, or maybe one ton, um, but that's a measurable amount. If we don't meet that mark, then we have to come back and say, well, I didn't do two tons, but I did one ton. And you go back into your funders and other, you know, your other stakeholders and say, we, we couldn't get that amount. But you got to have some sort of measurable amount. Attainable. I will recruit a team of 20 volunteers and work with city council to support our efforts to remove the trash. So once we collect the trash, it's got to go somewhere. So we have to work with the city so that we can figure out. So that's got to make it attainable. Once you really collect the trash, what then? Okay. Realistic. I will recruit college students in the spring semester and ask local businesses for cleaning supplies. Make it a little bit more realistic and time-based. We will accomplish this during the three months of summer of 2022. So when you go to your other stakeholders and your funders, you say, this is, this is our, our goal. This is how we're going to achieve it. Any questions on that? Yes, sir. I have five minutes left. Oh, for real? Okay. Oh, I'm almost done. So who is our target in our, our advocacy work? Is it the community that we're serving, potential funders, politicians, or the public in general? So if we're going to do the public, we may have to have a large, you know, campaign, billboards, or commercials. Um, the politicians, how we're going to engage with those politicians to change policy, the communities that you serve. So my question is, why is this important? Anybody want to answer that real quick? Why is it important to understand who your target is as you're doing your advocacy work? That way you won't have a, a large target. You want to focus in and have a very, uh, I would say, visible target that you can work with and get something done with as opposed to a broad shotgun approach. You want to have right. a sniper. Exactly. Like the limits, the power of limits. Okay. All right. Let's move on. So I got my five minutes. Okay, some of the tools that you need, data, financial resources, and partners and allies. These are just some of the tools we need. If we're gonna talk about changing the math and science scores of the kids in school, we gotta know where they are right now. If they're at a 25% pass rate, we gotta have that data. What are some of the reasons why the pass rate's so low? We're gonna talk about incarceration. Why do we have 
30% of young African-American young men and women in jail? What, what, what are the factors that are leading to that? When we find that they are hanging out partying, it, most arrests are happening on Saturday night between 2 and 6 a.m., then maybe we need to have some sort of program where we can pull them out of, after the party. They can all go to Waffle House or something. I don't know. Somewhere. So what is the data showing us in terms of how we address it? Our financial resources, the fundraising, the grants, the other ways in which we can you know, raise money for our, our, our projects, those are also very, very key. We can't, that's a whole another conversation. Um, and then your partners and allies. You can't do this work alone. Your church can't do it alone. We have to have a collaborative approach to some of these issues. And like you said, y'all might have to have a meeting and just hash it out. One group may say we should do X, another group needs to say Y, but at least you're in that same space where you can talk about these issues and try to figure out a plan that's gonna work. Messaging. We all know the standard, the Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. I, I have a college student now, intern. I don't, I don't do none of that. She's just so great and she just does it all. So if we can find somebody that can help you with that, that's great. But there's other apps too. Um, there's different fundraising apps. And the fun thing about the fundraising apps is that you can do it like a competition. You could do the men's choir versus the women's choir. Who's gonna raise the most money, you know? In the, next, in the next month. So there's different ways in which you can get people engaged that makes it fun and exciting. Of course, you have your newsletters, make sure your website is on point and traditional media. Sometimes you may just have to do an interview or put an editorial in the paper. Um, you know, we still are reading our African-American newspapers. I still get them. So there's still an outreach that we can use through tradi traditional media to get our word across. Now, methods. Eh, stop that. Let me go a little bit. So what are some of the methods? This is, think so? Okay, I'm not gonna stop. What I want us to think about is what methods can we do to address some of these issues? And we're in a different time and space. So the methods that we address, use to address our issues must be new, innovative, creative, and then I have evidence-based with a question mark. I personally don't like evidence-based because somebody has to do it first time in order for you to get the evidence. And sometimes people are like, well, is that evidence-based? I'm like, but if it's new and creative and it's innovative to address the situation, there's not gonna be any evidence. So for example, in Durham, y'all may have heard that they're giving a guaranteed income to try to alleviate poverty. This is happening in different cities throughout the country. It's a new program. As the data is showing so far that it's having an impact in terms of how impoverished people are able to get a hold of their lives and move forward, okay? Another one is using hotels um, for, um, to address homelessness. But there was another program I was actually looking for where um, they're building like maybe smaller and modular um, houses to help with the homeless. So somebody, had, so when somebody goes to the city council saying we want to do modular homes for the home for the homeless. Well, where's your evidence? There's not going to be any evidence because we're doing this the first time we're doing it. But the times require new and innovative solutions, and to be bold and to go out there and try to address these things in a different way, and to have the guts to do it. Okay, and I think I'm on my last slide now. This one is important. Remember the importance. Despite the fact that we want new innovative creations, we cannot underestimate the power of our older strategies. So up here I have the Women's March, the March Against the War in Iraq, the Arab Spring, Occupy Wall Street, Black Lives Matter. If y'all can think of one thing that they have in common, what's the one thing or two things they have in common, one or two things they have in common? They brought awareness. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. They, 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 they definitely were protests, but I'm a, I'll, since, I'm, since I'm short on time, I'm gonna tell you. What made these things different? Number one, they were the largest marches of their time. The numbers of these marches are just off the, off the charts. Secondly, they use social media to kind of galvanize support. However, we don't really hear too much from these organizations, do we? Mm -hmm. So they started with a protest. And then what was after that? Mm 
So this is why you have to have, you can't discount what happened in the past. So what you have to, they didn't do any long-term planning and organizing that the older movements did. You have to build the networks and you have to build community so that you can sustain the movement. So they did the protest first and didn't do any movement building afterwards. Whereas, oh my goodness, sorry. Whereas in the civil rights, because people are like, oh, look what happened to the civil rights movement, environmental movement. That's because those were established organizations and networks and community that had built in strategies so that the protest is the end of the sentence not the first part of the sentence. So when we look at all those great movements, we're like, well, what's Black Lives Matter doing now? Well, they're doing some things a little bit differently, but these entities have not lasted it because they have not built community. So especially in the church and some of the things that we did in the civil rights movement, that movement building is still important. So we can't just throw out everything that we've ever done as we think of new solutions, okay? All right, let me move on. Final thoughts with faith, hope, and love. We can make a change. I had some more, but that was it. And are there any questions? I had one more little slide. Of it. Absolutely. Vote, vote, vote. Vote like your lives depend on it. Yes, ma'am.